Two weeks passed just like that. After everything was said and done, the world had indeed come to unify together and be a better place to live in. Only around 20 or so people returned back to the tower, not intending to work for anyone else. Ning was surprised to see both Alekor and Rachel there. Alekor was a son of a duke. Ning was sure that after the tower no longer existed in name, he would leave. However, it seemed that he liked doing what he did, and since he had an older brother, he didn't have to worry about the dukedom. Rachel on the other hand was even more surprising. With how bad their relationship had been, even as a friend after she revealed him to the tower as a spy, he was sure now that his identity had been revealed again, she would leave for sure. However, she had somehow approached him on her own and requested that she be taught directly by him. She must have seen my fight with the old man, Ning thought. Other than that, there was one more person whose existence surprised Ning. Darian Cannon, the rightful heir of the Sarian Empire had decided to join the tower as well. Are you sure you don't want to stay back? Come up with a coup idea or something, Ning said. Darian suddenly glared at him. Geez, it's a joke, Ning said. If you want to come with me, I won't say no I am always happy to have as much help as I can get. Ning looked at the others gathered around him. Marasi, Mercy, Silvers, Hira, and a few captains as well as squad members. In total, no more than twenty. All right, let's leave, he said and with a simple gesture, opened a portal. A cold wind blew out of the portal toward everyone standing in front of it. In fact, it was so cold that some of the girls even started to shiver a little. Um, you never mentioned where exactly we were going, did you? Marasi asked with a little fear on her face. Her whole life, she had lived under the hot sun, training until her body was tanned to the point that she looked like she didn't belong there. However, now feeling this cold air, she couldn't help but be a little apprehensive about what was coming for her. Go on. You will find out soon, Ning said with a light smile on his face. You won't tell us, will you? Hira asked from the side. Well, it's a surprise, so no, Ning said. Fine, she said and directly jumped into the portal. I'm gathering people to kick your butt if I don't like the place, Marasi said as she went in as well. Mercy glared at him, Silvers shook his head, and Alekor simply laughed. Darian showed a curious expression, while Rachel seemed to know where they were headed. The rest of them were on either side of the fence, but they all walked through the portal in the end. Finally, once everyone was gone, Ning walked through as well, leaving the place where the Aether Tower originated to go to the place where the tower's creator came from. Ning arrived at the south pole of the planet. Frigid ice filled the landscape as extremely cold air blew past everyone's faces. Marasi and some of the other people were already wearing thick clothes that they had created as soon as they arrived, and were handing out more to the others that walked through. Hey, that's not necessary, Ning said as he pointed towards a tower that stood at the peak of the mountain. We are staying up there, he said. Everyone looked at the place and was shocked. We're staying in this cold. Marasi shouted with audible anger in her voice. You'll see, Ning said as he made a grabbing motion and suddenly everyone felt weightless. Then, in the next moment, Ning created another portal and tossed it. When Ning entered and appeared out of the portal, he was immediately confronted with the warm air of the tower. Whoa! It's not cold at all, someone said with a surprised look. Some of them even started taking off the jackets that they had just worn. You guys like this place? Ning asked. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty good, Murasi said. How did a tower appear here? Oh, I made it of course, Ning said. Took me a week and a half. You did this in a week? Murasi said with shock written on her face. Yeah, it's pretty easy once you know how, Ning said. Did you make this with ether too? Marasi asked. No, Ning said. I used rocks from around the world to make this place. Honestly, it was quite hard. Still, it came out looking nice, he said. Alekor looked at the black walls and empty rooms. Seems like you based it on the tower, so it looks familiar, he said. Yes, Ning said. Well, not everything. For one, I didn't make any doors. What? A few of the people shouted at once. What? Ning asked, you guys want to go to the frigid cold. But how are we going to leave? Someone complained. By opening a portal, Ning said. Some of the people looked troubled. Ning, Rachel said. We, we don't know how to open portals. In fact, we don't have the ether to do so even if we did. Oh, don't worry about that, Ning said and took out some things from his storage. In a coordinated motion, many items flew out to different people. Most of the people got vials of ether. 
a few potions with correct labels, and some scrolls to teach them the best absorption method. Learn that technique, and absorb that ether, Ning ordered them. Once you do that, you will surely reach Ether Emperor at the very least. After that, you will reach Saint in a few days. For those that are already Saint and above, I will have to get some more Ether for you. Until then, just learn the technique, Ning said. Go explore the tower for now, Ning said. I have some things to do, so I will see you soon. When Ning reappeared from his teleportation, he was flying on top of the massive ocean that took over one half of the entire world. Ning enforced his body and dove into the water. The many fishes and sea monsters swam past him as he let his body drop to the depths of the ocean. As the pressure increased, Ning also started feeling the pull of the ether within him. This concentration was too strong, and even his underlord body was feeling the effect. If I had let it be, it would have gathered so much in the next few years, he thought, however, he didn't want to wait that long. Now that the origin had opened up, he didn't have to keep these things down here. When Ning finally reached the bottom of the ocean, Doing his darndest to push back the millions of tons of water, he reached out to the giant glass sphere. The moment he touched it, it disappeared into his storage. Ning teleported out and went to another location to do the same thing. After going in a circle around the origin, he finally managed to gather all the massive glass spheres he had left behind. Finally, he crossed through a folded space by entering through the perfect location hung in the sky and appeared inside the origin. So it really is unlocked, huh? He thought to himself, that means she truly is gone. Ning felt a tinge of sadness at the death of Alexis, but there was nothing he could have done to prevent it. Just like he couldn't prevent the ones he loved from dying. Ning shook his head and walked upon the familiar red ground of the origin. He walked up the mountain and looked down on the water that had alpurite mixed into it. It wasn't very dense in the water itself, but that did not mean ether wasn't flowing out of the pool. What's the time difference in this place compared to outside? Ning asked. Hmm, is that lower or higher than Kumia? Ning wondered. He quickly calculated and after seeing that it was just about the same difference, he stopped worrying about it. I guess nearly two hours for each energy reset is still pretty good, he thought and brought out the giant glass sphere with a very concentrated solution of water and alpurite. As soon as it appeared, the ether in the area immediately rushed towards it, and the purple liquid started getting darker and darker. Ning left that and went to a different location before bringing out another one. Then another one, and another one. In the end, he ended up with 10 glass marbles that each held about 4,200 liters of very, very high concentration of ether solution. Once everything was set up, Ning walked away from the location in fear of losing his own ether. After he was sufficiently far enough, he sat down and started gathering ether like a madman. For the next whole day, he did nothing but collect energy as well as cultivate ether. At this rate, I will only need four years to get back the amount I lost by removing everyone's memories, won't I? He thought. That fixed his mood a lot as he realized he wouldn't have to wait 80 years on this planet to get back what he lost. After two more days of collecting ether, he left, he still had a lot of different things to do before he could just settle down in the origin. Ning returned back to his house in the Demir city where the old woman Donnie and Helena were staying. Ning put on a foolish smile when he remembered how much he had to apologize to her for nearly killing her with fright. After Ning and Alexis had left to find Darian, the old woman had stumbled upon Ning's corpse and thought that Alexis had killed him for some petty reason. Hey, Mrs. Ghani, are you making potions? He asked as he walked through the door. Ah, oh, she squealed loudly. Make some noise before you suddenly start talking. You nearly gave me a heart attack. Ah, oh, sorry, sorry. Ning said. The old woman continued making her potions while Ning looked at what she was making. Are you only making healing potions? Ning asked. And potions for better sleep. The people out there need it, the old woman said. I see, Ning said. Do you want helpers? You could teach people how to make potions too. I think that would help you fantastically. That, hum, that's not a bad idea, Gani said. Although I would like to learn a bit more myself before I think of teaching. Yes. Yes, of course, Ning said. Also, where is Helena? He asked. School. She should be returning soon, Gani said. I see, then let me help you make some more potions, he said and got to work. About an hour or so later, Helena returned in her white and blue uniform from a nearby school. Grandma, I'm hungry, she shouted as she made her way into the upper floor. Oh, teacher. You're already here? She said with surprise. 
Wait, let me go get ready. Stop, Ning said. You need to eat first, the rest can come later. Ah, he he, she gave a sheepish grin. After Helena finished eating her afternoon lunch, Ning brought her to the underground floor to teach her the ether arts. Helena was slowly improving, but there was some definite improvement. Her control over the energy itself was fantastic, and as Ning helped show her everything, her mental image of how things are and should be also improved a lot, in return improving her ether arts as well. At the age of 20 years old, Helena had already become an ether magister. If people from this world found out, they would surely scold Ning for doing something so outrageous. Ning brought out a thick book and handed it to her. What's this, teacher? She asked. This is a list of all the ingredients for potions and what they do. From now on, you will start helping your grandmother little by little. Time slowly passed as everyone continued doing their own thing. Old woman Gani focused on learning the potions and even started taking students to teach them. Helena slowly learned from Ning and also got incredibly talented in the ways of ether. In just 10 years, she went from being an ether master to an ether emperor. And that was simply because Ning held her back from breaking through. She also learned potions from Ning's books as well as her grandma, and in just a few years helped her grandma manage the potion shop. With the emperor's permission, the Ghani potion shop opened up to become one of the major shops in all of Demir city. Back in the peak of afterlife, where Ning had created the tower, the group of 20 or so had increased to become 50 now. Ning wasn't sure when they hired, but from the looks of it, the captains and squad members had used their connections to rope in more people. Ning taught them all as best as he could. After getting some bottles of ether, Marasi had ranked up to the underlord rank. Hira and Rachel were both at the saint rank now, and would soon make it to the supreme rank, which a few of the captains as well as Alekor had reached. Ning made sure to teach him the most, alongside Rachel. Rachel's skill to absorb ether made her an incredible hand to hand fighter. After learning that she didn't need to process the ether she stole and directly absorbed it, Ning had begun training her as best he could. Alekor, on the other hand, was already an incredible ether user. Ning simply helped enhance his abilities. At the same time, Ning also taught them potions, just so they could save themselves if they ever needed it. I'm giving these for you to handle. Ning said as he gave Alekor a storage gem that he had created himself. Creating a storage gem was tricky, but easy. All one had to do was take an ether ore that looked more like a crystal than stone, and carve it until only the crystal part remained. Then, you needed to create a black hole at the center of the crystal that directly dragged in the space from outside. Once enough space was dragged in, you stopped the black hole, and at the same time made the outer area push in the space to keep it intact inside the gem. After a while of keeping the space inside, the ether in the gem would take upon the task of containing the space itself, which would replenish on its own too. And now, Ning had given such a gem to Alekor, who couldn't help but ask, what's in here? Alekor put a little ether onto the gem and his vision transported to the inside of it as he checked what was there. All he could see were millions upon millions of glass spheres. Are these? He asked with nothing but shock on his face. Yes, Ning said. That only increased Alakor's shock. Why are you giving me this? He asked. So you can use it when necessary. I trust your judgment, Ning said. Alekor still couldn't help but fear. He had become a supreme, yes, but there were underlords in the team now. Two at that. Why give this to me, and not Captain or Old Man Darian? Alekor asked. I don't know if Marasi would be up for the task. All she wants to do is fight. As for Old Man Darian, I don't think he cares about these things, Ning said. I see, Alekor said. Ning's words made sense to him. All right, I will do it. Good, Ning said. Here's a reward for you then. Ning brought out a glass bottle with almost pitch black liquid that only shone purple on the edges. When the bottle came out, Alekor felt the ether in his body try to leave it. This is for me? Alekor asked with surprise. Yes, Ning said. With this, you should be able to reach Underlord. Drink it tonight and absorb it. Shouldn't take more than a day. Oh, right. Make sure to dilute it first. Even as it goes inside you, it will be hard to absorb, and instead, it will steal the ether in your body, Ning said. Had to learn it the hard way. I see, Alekor said with shaky hands that threatened to drop the bottle. I will. Then, he looked back at Ning and asked, Are you leaving? Ning had mentioned having to leave some time in the future to everyone, so it was only natural for Alekor to ask that. Yes, Ning said with a tinge of sadness. I would love to stay around, 
but I have my own thing to do. So, this is goodbye. Elekor felt his eyes moisten a bit. I see, he said, showing no inflection on his voice. Thank you for all you have done. All right, I will leave now, Ning said. I have a few more people to say goodbye to. Ning went on to find Rachel and let her know he was leaving, same with Hira and Darian. Marasi gave him a grand goodbye by asking him to fight her one last time. Ning fought for as long as he could, but Marasi didn't manage to land a single hit on him. All she managed to do was show her how strong he had become now. An overlord? she asked in surprise. Yes, Ning said, you will reach there one day too. I have left some gifts for you to help with that. Thank you, Ning, Marasi said. Mercy and Silvers thanked him too. After saying farewell to everyone there, Ning left for Demir City to meet up with Helena and the others. Mrs. Ghani, how are you doing? He asked as he walked through the many disciples of the old woman Ghani. Oh, Ning. Come, come. Look at this new potion I made. This is amazing, she said as she showed him a creation of her. Ning walked forward to see with a smile. Oh, what is it? Ning asked as he walked forward toward the old woman. She put the final few drops of some liquid and shook it violently. Here, she handed it to him. Ning looked at the slightly golden liquid and asked, What is it? Drink it, the old woman said. Ning opened the stopper and downed the vial in one go. As it reached his body, he felt a warm sensation pass through his body. Suddenly, he felt like he wasn't hungry anymore. I feel satiated, Ning said. Right? With this potion, you will get all the necessary nutrients for your daily life, and it will also numb your stomach so that you don't feel hungry, she said. That's not bad, Ning said. I know, I have so many more ideas to go through. So many more potions to make, she said. Ning smiled. I'm leaving now, he said suddenly. The old woman stopped. What? she asked. I'm leaving. Now, Ning said. But, but you said you would leave only after. I know, Ning said. But this world doesn't need me now. Peace has come to the world, and if there is ever a threat, the tower will handle it. The old woman stayed silent for a bit. Have you spoken to Helena? she asked. I'm going to now, Ning said. Where is she? Underground. Training, the old woman said. Okay, I will go meet her then, Ning said. It was a pleasure meeting you, Mrs. Ghani. No, no, the old woman said. The pleasure was all mine, young man. Ning smiled and left. He went downstairs to meet Helena, who was fighting some puppet she had created herself. Not bad, he said. Helena stopped and looked around. Teacher, what are you doing here? she asked. Can I not come here now that I have stopped teaching you? he asked. No, no, that's not what I meant, she said. Helena had grown up in the past ten years, but not by much. At her age, most people in this world would have married by now, but she still looked like a kid thanks to breaking through her ether ranks very quickly. I know what you mean, Ning said with a smile, I'm here to say my goodbyes. Good, bye? Helena asked, are you leaving already? Yes, it's about time I go back to my loved ones, he said. You said they are far away, right? She asked. Yes, very far away, and I will likely never return, Ning said. How far? She asked, can't you just open a portal and come back? Where I am going, I won't be able to return here, so you will have to take care of yourself okay? And take care of your grandmother, Ning said. If you ever need help, go ask Marasi or Alekor, Ning said. Also, never let anyone know about the ring I gave you. Helena's eyes were tearing up already, but she nodded still. Yes, teacher, I understand, she said. Her sniffling grew loud as Ning patted her head and ruffled her hair. Helena couldn't stand her tears at all and jumped into a hug. I am going to miss you, teacher, she said while tears streamed down her cheeks. Ning felt a bit of tear gather in his eyes as well. I will miss you too, he said and hugged her back. After a minute or so of waiting for Helena to stop crying, Ning said a proper goodbye and left. He had one and final visit to make now. When Ning reappeared, he was in a garden that was mostly empty aside from some gardeners working on the hedges. On the swing were two little children, one boy with black hair and one girl with blonde hair, each about nine years old. Uncle Ning. Both of them cried out and ran towards Ning. Luke, Leia, come give uncle a hug, Ning said as he grabbed both of the children and lifted them into the air. Up up, Leia shouted with glee in her voice. Okay, Ning said and suddenly threw them up. 
Then, using telekinesis he kept them afloat. Ever since Ning had done that one day, the kids had started loving it. Hey brother Ning, Reaver walked from the side along with Lisa. You should have come around sooner. These kids love it when you play with them, Lisa said. Reaver had more talent than me, he should be able to play with his children better than me, Ning said. I don't think so. I've tried, but they always ask me to call you, Reaver said. They don't want to play with their dad. I'm sure they will, Ning said as his tone got a little sadder. They will have to. After all, this is the last day they will see me. What? Lisa asked with a serious face. I'm leaving, Ning told her. Leaving, as in what you told us before, Reaver asked. Yes, after I leave today, you won't see me ever again, he said. Reaver had known this day would come, but he hadn't expected it to come so soon. Are you, really leaving this planet? Reaver asked slowly. He had been the only person Ning ever told about his plans. Ning smiled and nodded. I will have to go somewhere and gather as much energy as I can before leaving, but yeah. I will be gone after today, Ning said. Have you, said your goodbyes to everyone? Reaver asked. Yes, Ning said. You guys were the ones I met first, so I left you for last. I see, then let us give you a farewell party, Lisa said. The party was small. Only the five of them were there as the servants brought different types of food. Ning, who didn't like drinking much, drank to his heart's content. His last day on the southern continent of Vilmore had become nothing but a banger. Finally, once the party was over, Reaver and Lisa gave him a heartfelt farewell amongst countless tears. And after that, Ning left, never to return back to the southern continent of Vilmore ever again. 210 years. That was how long Ning stayed in origin. Collecting ether for what was worth about 1800 normal years, he was finally getting close to unlocking the next energy for himself. Ning who had lost his mind to the numbness of passing time finally got a sense of self back. He had to look around and ask where he was. System, show status, he asked. Status name. Ning Ruigong energy, 995.8 trillion. Separated energy heat energy, 3.2 trillion sound energy, 4.6 trillion. Qi energy, zero kinetic energy, 11 trillion ether energy, 977 trillion. Skill. Damn, I'm so close, he thought. Ning tried to move but his body was crusted from over 200 years of water and dirt gathering on him. When he stood up, he felt a little unusual, like he didn't know how to walk. Also, he could feel a lot of ether inside his own body. System, what rank did I reach now? he asked. He remembered being an ether overlord beforehand. Now, he should have improved quite a bit, right? Whoa, that's the highest rank of ether, isn't it? Ning asked. Somehow he had not only ranked past ether archlord, but he had also gone past ether demigod to straight divinity. This was the power Alexis held, he thought. That was what had given him such an intense pain back when he tried to read her rank. Now, I'm at the same rank as her, he thought. He couldn't help but wonder what Alexis could do with her rank if she wasn't forced to not bring harm to anyone. Anyway, I am about 5 trillion away from unlocking the next energy. I will need to spend about half a year more here for that. Sigh, I don't want to stay here now that I've lost my concentration, he thought. I will go mental if I do that. Since he wasn't far away, he would earn the remaining energy while he left. Now that he was about to leave, he wanted to go check on the other people before he did. However, he knew that if he did so, he couldn't help but want to stay. So, he didn't want to do that. After confirming with the system that they were all doing fine and that no one needed his help, Ning flew out of the origin, and then out of the planet. Ning had one destination now. The sun, are you sure the auto-breathing skill will help me survive in space? Ning asked. Won't the emptiness of space cause problems for me? The system tried to console him. Ning decided to trust him. As he entered the upper atmosphere, the air got thinner and thinner. Soon, his skill kicked in and oxygen was directly created in his lungs. Usually, breathing only oxygen would be problematic for someone, but Ning didn't have to worry about that. Not only would his body heal itself from any problem he would suffer, but as an energy, he also had a separate mind of his own that he could use to control his body. Ning had wanted to change to something small and durable, but according to the system, any object that wasn't a living body would lose energy out in space. So, Ning decided to stay with his own body. As he went out of the atmosphere and into the sun just as he was getting high, Ning noticed intense heat on his body. What? 
I'm not even that far away from the planet, he said. Damn it, what should I do? Ning thought to himself. If this is going to be a constant in outer space, then I need to do something to protect myself. System. Any suggestion? What do the other hosts do? Ning asked. Oh, what does that do exactly? Ning asked. Oh, Ning said. How much does it cost? All right, stop, Ning said with a sigh. Give me the 2% one. Suddenly, the blisters that appeared and disappeared around his body started to fade a little. If Ning hadn't been paying attention, he wouldn't have noticed it. I should slowly get stronger now, right? He thought to himself. Then, he flew towards the sun Ning flew at a constant speed, but the closer he got, the faster he went. At some point, Ning slowly changed his angle and headed towards the edge of the sun instead of going directly into the sun, he went as close as he could without his body destroying itself. Then, just like any other planet and comets, he started circling the sun since this was going to be a monotonous task, Ning ordered the system to take control if he was headed for imminent danger. Then, the only thing he had to do was wait. Ning didn't know how long passed, but it was surely years. At certain times, he would notice that his body was stronger and that it wouldn't take damage from the sun anymore, so he went a little closer and continued circulating. Slowly, he was getting faster and faster. Not only that, his body was getting stronger and stronger as well. Once again, years passed until finally, Ning got a notification for himself. Unlock. Ning said. Ning felt all of his energy disappear, but he didn't care as he heard the next lines from the system. Ning needed electrical energy to double the cap with his separate energy, and since he had zero of it at the moment, he didn't have to worry about it at the moment. Ning stayed a few more days there to collect some energy so that he wasn't completely out of energy. System. He shouted. How long until I get to the escape point? Ning flew around the sun at an incredible speed for three more days until he reached the point of escape. A vision overlapped Ning's eyes as a green path appeared for him to take. When Ning reached that path, he suddenly increased his speed as fast as he could, so that he could reach a speed greater than the escape velocity of the sun from where he was. Then, he slingshot himself out of the sun's gravity well. The surrounding around him got colder and colder as Ning went further and further from the sun. Then, he looked ahead of him, at the vast emptiness of space as a bit of fear crept into his heart, as well as the excitement about what was coming next. He was now directly on his way to the closest planet that was inhabited. Ning was currently zipping through the space, pelleted by objects that floated in it. He had thought space was a vacuum, but he soon found out it was not, even space was full of microparticles, dust, and gases that managed to escape the gravity of stars. So, if not for his star strengthening technique, Ning would currently be filled to the brim with minor cuts and bruises from the impact of those objects. He looked ahead of him at the vast emptiness of the space. It was so dark out here that he could barely see his hands most of the time. It was only when he used his vision skill that he could see things properly. The moment he activated them, the space burst into a spectrum of glorious light that spanned from red to blue. Some starts were moving toward him, some were moving further away. Even his own body was getting stronger by a negligible amount from the star's radiation even this far out. Given how long he would have to be out here, Ning was sure that would add up to something significant. The closest star to the sun of Vilmore was about 12 light years away. That was to say, to reach the next inhabited planet, Ning would have to travel the distance that even light would take 12 years. And he was nowhere near to being a fraction of the speed as fast. At the speed Ning was moving through the void, it would take him exactly 20,000 years to reach the planet. Ning so desperately wanted to just sleep for that duration of time, but there was a reason he couldn't just switch to an ordinary object and sleep. In fact, there was two minor reasons that added up to be a very important reason. The first reason was that if he changed to something else, say even something strong as a diamond, being relentlessly pelleted by the particles would soon deform even diamond. A diamond may be hard, but it wasn't indestructible. That was one of the very reasons why Ning had gone with a body that regenerated, rather than one that was durable from the start. Of course, if Ning did take damage as even a diamond, he could use some energy to fix it. But that was where the second problem came in. If he was pelleted by outer dust and particles and was even the least bit destroyed, he would lose energy proportionally, unlike a living body that never lost energy no matter the damage. If you paired losing energy with needing the energy to get fixed, you would soon end up with no energy at all. And that was the biggest problem, because without energy, 
Ning couldn't speed himself up faster and would soon come to a nearly staggering halt. When that happened, he could only wish to reach the planet in this lifetime, not to mention Ely and the others. So, he had to give up some semblance of sanity, and stick to being awake half the time during the entire 20,000 years it would take him to reach the next planet. Ning was worried about many things, but the 20,000 years was something he wouldn't worry about at all. According to the system, since he was so far away from anything of mass, the time he experienced would be hundreds if not thousands of times faster than what he would experience next to any planet or celestial body of mass. Meaning he could fly for 20,000 years in the void, and it would only have been less than 20 years in Kumia. So, he was free to take his time, not to mention, if he did speed up, he would reach the next place faster. So, Ning continued his journey as if nothing bothered him and flew off as fast as he could. From time to time, he would realize that from the kinetic energy of striking the particles, his energy had increased a bit. As soon as that happened, he would put every single bit of energy into his flight skill to move as fast as he could. At one point, Ning even reached 0.002% of the speed of light. That made his travel so much faster. Ning slept most of the time, and it was the system that controlled his body when he did. Ning had given his system full control over the navigation, it was almost as if their position was changed. The system was now the user, and he was the one being used. Ning felt amazing having not to navigate through the vast space, because he didn't know what exactly was out there. At the speed he was going, he couldn't maneuver out of the way in time if he came across an asteroid as well. The system, however, preemptively diverted his path by the slightest angle such that when he reached the spot where they would crash, he would be almost a kilometer away from the object. Ning opened his eyes from one of his regular sleep that seemed to last for ages, he wasn't sure if he was actually going to sleep, or simply losing consciousness from the sheer boredom. Immediately, he put all of the energy he had gathered in this time into his speed and propelled him forward again. System. How far along am I? He asked. 300. Ning thought. That was quite close. Ning looked at the star in the distance and recognized the most bright one. It glowed with a red hue that surprised Ning a little. A red star? He thought. Is that the one where I am headed? Isn't a red star a dying star? He asked. As far as he knew, a blue star was a newly formed star, an orange one was a star in its middle stages, and a red star was one at its end. Ning thought for a second. Well, if the system says there are lives then who am I to care, he thought. Ning was currently zipping through the space, pelleted by objects that floated in it. He had thought space was a vacuum, but he soon found out it was not. Even space was full of microparticles, dust, and gases that managed to escape the gravity of stars. So, if not for his star strengthening technique, Ning would currently be filled to the brim with minor cuts and bruises from the impact of those objects. He looked ahead of him at the vast emptiness of the space, it was so dark out here that he could barely see his hands most of the time. It was only when he used his vision skill that he could see things properly. The moment he activated them, the space burst into a spectrum of glorious light that spanned from red to blue. Some starts were moving toward him, some were moving further away. Even his own body was getting stronger by a negligible amount from the star's radiation even this far out. Given how long he would have to be out here, Ning was sure that would add up to something significant. The closest star to the sun of Vilmore was about 12 light years away. That was to say, to reach the next inhabited planet, Ning would have to travel the distance that even light would take 12 years. And he was nowhere near to being a fraction of the speed as fast. At the speed Ning was moving through the void, it would take him exactly 20,000 years to reach the planet. Ning so desperately wanted to just sleep for that duration of time, but there was a reason he couldn't just switch to an ordinary object and sleep. In fact, there was two minor reason, that added up to be a very important reason. The first reason was that if he changed to something else, say even something strong as a diamond, being relentlessly pelleted by the particles would soon deform even diamond. A diamond may be hard, but it wasn't indestructible. That was one of the very reasons why Ning had gone with a body that regenerated, rather than one that was durable from the start. Of course, if Ning did take damage as even a diamond, he could use some energy to fix it. But that was where the second problem came in. If he was pelleted by outer dust and particles and was even the least bit destroyed, he would lose energy proportionally, unlike a living body that never lost energy no matter the damage. If you paired losing energy, with needing the energy to get fixed, you would soon end up with no energy at all. And that was the biggest problem. 
because without energy, Ning couldn't speed himself up faster and would soon come to a nearly staggering halt. When that happened, he could only wish to reach the planet in this lifetime, not to mention Ely and the others. So, he had to give up some semblance of sanity, and stick to being awake half the time during the entire 20,000 years it would take him to reach the next planet. Ning was worried about many things, but the 20,000 years was something he wouldn't worry about at all. According to the system, since he was so far away from anything of mass, the time he experienced would be hundreds if not thousands of times faster than what he would experience next to any planet or celestial body of mass. Meaning he could fly for 20,000 years in the void, and it would only have been less than 20 years in Kumia. So, he was free to take his time, not to mention, if he did speed up, he would reach the next place faster. So, Ning continued his journey as if nothing bothered him and flew off as fast as he could. From time to time, he would realize that from the kinetic energy of striking the particles, his energy had increased a bit. As soon as that happened, he would put every single bit of energy into his flight skill to move as fast as he could. At one point, Ning even reached 0.002% of the speed of light. That made his travel so much faster. Ning slept most of the time, and it was the system that controlled his body when he did. Ning had given his system full control over the navigation, it was almost as if their position was changed. The system was now the user, and he was the one being used. Ning felt amazing having not to navigate through the vast space, because he didn't know what exactly was out there. At the speed he was going, he couldn't maneuver out of the way in time if he came across an asteroid as well. The system, however, preemptively diverted his path by the slightest angle such that when he reached the spot where they would crash, he would be almost a kilometer away from the object. Ning opened his eyes from one of his regular sleep that seemed to last for ages. He wasn't sure if he was actually going to sleep, or simply losing consciousness from the sheer boredom. Immediately, he put all of the energy he had gathered in this time into his speed and propelled him forward again. System, how far along am I? He asked. You are about 300 years away. 300? Ning thought. That was quite close. Ning looked at the star in the distance and recognized the most bright one. It glowed with a red hue that surprised Ning a little. A red star? He thought, is that the one where I am headed? Yes, isn't a red star a dying star? He asked. As far as he knew, a blue star was a newly formed star, an orange one was a star in its middle stages, and a red star was one at its end. Yes Ning thought for a second. Well, if the system says there are lives then who am I to care, he thought. The red star looked bright now. It was very close to what Ning could see in the distance. It looked about the size of a normal sun, but given that it was a red giant, he was sure that he still had quite far to go. As he got closer, Ning asked the system, how much further is it? Ning looked in the direction the system told him to and saw a small object shining on just one side, giving a crescent look to him. So that's where I'm headed huh? He asked the system. Of course, the system gave no answer and that was all the confirmation Ning needed. He didn't need to sleep anymore. As he got closer to the sun, his radiation strengthening started working once again. By now, he had the physical body closer to that of a nascent soul realm, or full enforcement of an ether emperor. He wished he had a stronger body, but that would require him to spend some more energy or time around places with actual starlight. Now that he was on this planet, he would strengthen himself a bit and get a little stronger before moving on to the star that was about two light years away from here which had a wormhole that lead to the other side of the galaxy to the very corner. From there, he would have to go towards the next galaxy on his path where time moved at around the same rate as in Kumia. That was a problem for Ning, but he still had many years to go until that point. There was no point in worrying about the future right now. For now, he would enjoy some years in this place then and once he had enough energy, he would leave. As he got closer to the planet, Ning saw more and more of the planet. To be accurate, it looked more like a moon than a planet. From what he could see, there were still planet-like features like oceans and continents, but everything was so gray and murky. He could see clouds hanging in the sky, as well as landmasses with ice on top of it. If this was a planet, Ning couldn't understand how it could be inhabited. Ning started to wonder if humans even lived in this world, or if there were other races that lived underground. That could certainly be the case, he thought to himself. Just as he was about to think of something else, he noticed something on the dark side of the planet. There were flashes of light that came and went in an instant. Ning looked closely and even used his Vision 3 skill to see everything clearly as if it were daylight. 
When he saw what it was, his eyes went wide. There was a storm brewing on the night side of the planet. And in that storm, were flashes of lighting. Electrical energy. He thought and directly flew towards the planet. It would take him about two hours to get there at his current speed. As he got closer and closer, Ning started noticing that the storm was slowly moving towards the right side of the planet. System. How long until my cap resets? He asked. Good, Ning said. Once his energy cap was reset, he would try to absorb nothing but just electrical energy. Ning suddenly felt resistance against him. His speed was considerably depleting, but he was still so fast that he couldn't be stopped. He was far faster than a normal asteroid or comet that would move around in the system. Shit. He thought. If he crashed onto the planet without being able to stop his progress, he would definitely cause massive damage to one area of the land. If he landed on the ocean at his current speed, he would cause a tsunami that would kill millions. So, immediately, Ning turned himself around and used the resistance of the air in the atmosphere to slow himself down. At the same time, he started flying in the other direction. A fire burned beneath his feet from the sheer friction of him when coming in contact with the atmosphere. Even with how strong his body was, he could feel his feet tear up and immediately heal from the force. Even after that, he was quite fast and would certainly cause a massive crater and earthquake, so, he needed to find a good place. Where can I land so that I don't kill anyone? He asked. Which side is north? He asked. Okay. Ning shouted and changed his direction slightly so that he would fly towards the mountain ranges in the north. Soon, he saw them. Large numbers of ice capped peaks reached the sky. There were dozens of such peaks forming in no particular order. As Ning got closer, he braced for impact. He immediately crouched into a ball and slammed through one of the icy peaks, then to the heart of another one, before coming out of it and leaving a long gash on the surface of the planet as he finally slammed onto the third peak. The sound alone caused an avalanche to start on multiple peaks, not to mention the earthquake it caused. Ning lost his legs, his arms, part of his stomach, and most of his head were scraped to the point that only bones remained. When he finally stopped, he couldn't even voice his thoughts as his mind was in disarray from the sudden impact. A second later, flesh and bones wriggled around the parts where he lost it, and soon new pairs of legs and arms grew, along with the other parts that he had lost. Finally, once everything was back, Ning stood out of the crater and looked at the mess he made. There was only one knowledge that gave him solace in this situation. Well, at least I didn't kill anyone, did I? Ning looked at his surroundings again. The damage he had caused to three mountains was quite high, not to mention all the avalanches he had caused. He stood in the crater of his own wreckage and sighed. Was there an earthquake that might have accidentally done some damage? He asked. I see, he said as he scratched his arms a little. I must have slowed down a lot then. Also, these mountains really softened the blow. Ning finally walked out of the crater and looked at the surrounding. The barren, desolate mountain ranges were now scattered with snow on it. It's not as cold as I thought it would be here, Ning thought for a moment. Is it because of my body? He was quite happy to get a body with such strength now. I should be able to absorb some of the lightning strikes without taking any damage right? He thought. Soon, he used some energy to buy himself a basic map of the planet. The planet Hoflar was divided into five different continents. The two smaller continents were to the east, followed by three larger continents to the west. Each of the continents in those two groups was connected by thin pieces of land. Ning was currently on the northern continent of the group of two, the continent known as Tyrellia. There were a bunch of countries and city names on the map, but Ning didn't care about it much. However, one thing did become obvious from the map, it was the fact that people did live on the surface of the planet. Well, then they are stupid to live on such a desolate planet, Ning thought. Or, maybe they evolved to live here. Maybe they need less oxygen and food, as well as don't require plants. Ooh, what if this is a futuristic land where factories are everywhere and people's life itself is desolate, Ning thought while scratching his chest. Well, I don't have to think that for now, Ning thought and looked to the skies around him. Is the storm going to come by here or am I going to have to wait for another one to brew? Ning asked the system. Well, time to go to sleep for 18 hours then, Ning thought and found a random rock to switch his body into. Once he stored his body inside, his mind went unconscious. A second later, he woke up from his sleep to the sounds of thunder rumbling overhead. Suddenly, Ning's body appeared out of nowhere, and he switched his body. Then, there was nothing but a smile on his face. In a single leap, 
Ning flew all the way to the sky. The storm did nothing to stop him the cold air couldn't freeze him either. Snow fell from the sky in the midst of flashes of lightning, and just as Ning was about to wonder when it would hit him, suddenly a single bolt of lightning fell onto him. That bolt alone was more than enough to fill his cap twenty folds. Ning saw the charred flesh on his body, which immediately healed itself without him having to worry about it. However, if not for his body taking an electrical energy first, Ning was sure the heat would have filled his cap. He wanted to immediately double his energy cap using electrical energy by simply paying 25 million and 250 million, but the heat would take over first. So, Ning had to wait for a few minutes. Just then, another bolt of lightning fell onto him, leaving another hot mess on his body. Shit! He thought and immediately flew to the ground to take cover. Only after a few more minutes when the heat on his body died down did he finally decide to do it. System, double my cap twice, Ning said. I have four more billion of energy that I can gather today, Ning thought as he scratched his head. Even as he sat around, the constant motion, sound, and heat were being absorbed by his body. He needed to work fast. Once again, Ning jumped into the sky and was struck by a bolt of lightning. Immediately, his cap for the day was filled once again. He flew back down to the ground and said, Status. Status name. Ning Ruigong Energy, 4.8 billion. Separated energy heat energy, 122 million sound energy, 46 million. Kinetic energy, 61 million electrical energy, 4.6 billion. Qi energy, 0 ether energy, 0 skill. Ning sighed when he saw that. Even if he collected nothing but electrical energy tomorrow, which was more than impossible, he was still going to be about a hundred or so million energy short for the third energy double, which cost 10 billion. Sigh. I can't help but just wait around, huh? He thought. With nothing else to do, Ning grabbed a stone from the ground again and went to sleep. Exactly five minutes before his cap was reset, he woke up once again and asked the system about the location of the storm, or any storm for that matter. Once he got the information, he waited right until when his cap was unlocked and teleported. Immediately, Ning arrived in the midst of a thunderstorm and was struck down by a bolt of stray lightning into the sea. Great! Ning shouted. Once his body healed, he switched places with his spear and jumped into the sea, not noticing the plethora of dead fishes that floated on the surface. Exactly at the same time tomorrow again, Ning did the same thing and teleported into an active storm. Hails bombarded him like bullets, giving him kinetic energy. Ning was worried for a bit but then lightning struck him directly in the chest. Ning was thrown back to the ground, but even as he did, he couldn't help but show a satisfied smile. With this, his journey as an energy literally got ten times easier. Ning stepped back and looked at the girl closely, indeed, it didn't look like she had it all together at all. Her skin was fully decomposed with skeletons showing through most of it. Even then, she somehow managed to growl and come towards Ning with the slow speed of a snail and the hunger of a beast that hadn't eaten in days. Ning quickly got rid of her arms from his own arm and then kept the girl back through telekinesis. Zombies? Seriously? You brought me to a planet full of zombies? Ning asked with confusion and annoyance in his voice. God damn it, I hate zombies. You probably don't know because you had disabled yourself, but I have been through such a thing before too. And let me tell you, I did not like it at all, Ning said. I did not bring you to a planet full of zombies the apocalypse took place in between the years it took us to get here. Tisk, Ning said and pushed the girl back. What do I do now? Leave? He asked. You can do whatever you want but I ask that you help them if you can. Oh, Ning said. The system never really asked for his help, did it? The only time it did was when there was a system or something like that involved. Wait, was this caused by some sort of system? Ning asked with a curious voice. No, there are no system users on this planet. Hmm, then who do you want me to help? Ning asked before looking toward the woman in front of her. It can't be this zombie, right? It's already dead from what I can see, Ning said. Then, he realized something. Oh, there must be people hidden all around the world then. Do they need my help? Ning asked. He could imagine the people living in fear of the zombies outside. With how strong these zombies were, Ning was sure that if they did come out of hiding, a normal human would simply die. Ning waited for the system to say yes before asking how he could help these people. However, the system didn't say what he thought he would hear. No, there are no humans left in this world anymore. Everyone has become a zombie. 
Ning's face fell in shock. What? he asked. Everyone is dead? Yes, and no Ning unintentionally scratched his forehead as he asked, what do you mean? Every human on this planet is no more as they have all turned to zombies. However, as zombies, they haven't died yet, so all the humans are still alive in a sense. After all, no one is truly dead until their souls have left their body. Which means, as long as these zombies are alive, the souls won't be able to go through the reincarnation cycle, right? Ning asked. Yes, they will remain on the precipice dead and alive for a long time, they will remain undead. So, is there really no one alive? Ning asked. What about beasts and plants? Those have to have souls too, right? Plants and beasts don't have souls in most places. If they do end up with a soul, they will show intelligence. So, only a few of them ever do have soul. Ning shook his head. All right, what can I do? How should I help them? Ning asked. Ever since he reincarnated, he never really denied someone the help they needed. He wasn't going to stop doing that now. You will need to kill them to release their soul. I see, Ning said. You won't disappear on me because I kill some innocent soul now, will you? Ning joked a little, but the system still answered him. No, you aren't killing them. You are saving them from the miserable fate of never passing on. Sigh, you didn't have to answer that, Ning said as he called out his spear from his storage and cut the woman in front of him in two. Is that enough or do I have to do something else? Ning asked. You will be able to kill them as long as you separate their heart from their brain. I see, Ning said and looked at the woman. He had cut her a little to below the chest. So, with a single slash of his spear, he finished the job. Then, Ning walked out of the building into the desolate road with rocks and debris all around the place. Ning sighed and looked at the group of zombies that seemed to have noticed him. Oh, I won't have to walk to them, Ning said and suddenly caused a very large sound from his body. His energy dwindled a little as the loud sound spread throughout the city. He scratched his cheeks as he waited for the zombies to hear him and come toward him. Soon, there were many. Ning slashed a few of them, but he quickly realized that he couldn't go on like this. Air cutter spread out from in front of him as it carved its way through the many necks in the crowd. Ning finished the ones that weren't properly cut. Once that was done, Ning made another loud sound and waited, but no one came. Is that it for the city? He thought, yes, sigh, how many more zombies are there to go through? He asked. There are still 7,844,365,392 zombies roaming the planet. What the hell? That's going to take such a long time, Ning complained. Damn it, can't they kill themselves or something? They look pretty excited about that. In the first place, how did so many people even end up becoming zombies? He asked while scratching his thigh. An alien virus made its way here not long ago and it has been spread through the air and water. Anything that doesn't have a soul, but was living is already. An alien virus? Ning asked with surprise. Yes the very same one that has been causing you to itch so much ever since you got here. Ning stepped back and looked at the girl closely, indeed, it didn't look like she had it all together at all. Her skin was fully decomposed with skeletons showing through most of it. Even then, she somehow managed to growl and come towards Ning with the slow speed of a snail and the hunger of a beast that hadn't eaten in days. Ning quickly got rid of her arms from his own arm and then kept the girl back through telekinesis. Zombies? Seriously? You brought me to a planet full of zombies? Ning asked with confusion and annoyance in his voice. God damn it, I hate zombies. You probably don't know because you had disabled yourself, but I have been through such a thing before too. And let me tell you. I did not like it at all, Ning said. Tisk, Ning said and pushed the girl back. What do I do now? Leave? He asked. Oh, Ning said. The system never really asked for his help, did it? The only time it did was when there was a system or something like that involved. Wait, was this caused by some sort of system? Ning asked with a curious voice. Hmm, then who do you want me to help? Ning asked before looking toward the woman in front of her. It can't be this zombie, right? It's already dead from what I can see, Ning said. Then, he realized something. Oh, there must be people hidden all around the world then. Do they need my help? Ning asked. He could imagine the people living in fear of the zombies outside. With how strong these zombies were, Ning was sure that if they did come out of hiding, a normal human would simply die. Ning waited for the system to say yes before asking how he could help these people. However, the system didn't say what he thought he would hear. 
Ning's face fell in shock. What? he asked. Everyone is dead? Ning unintentionally scratched his forehead as he asked, What do you mean? Sai, you didn't have to answer that, Ning said as he called out his spear from his storage and cut the woman in front of him in two. Is that enough or do I have to do something else? Ning asked. I see, Ning said and looked at the woman. He had cut her a little to below the chest. So, with a single slash of his spear, he finished the job. Then, Ning walked out of the building into the desolate road with rocks and debris all around the place. Ning sighed and looked at the group of zombies that seemed to have noticed him. Oh, I won't have to walk to them, Ning said and suddenly caused a very large sound from his body. His energy dwindled a little as the loud sound spread throughout the city. He scratched his cheeks as he waited for the zombies to hear him and come toward him. Soon, there were many. Ning slashed a few of them, but he quickly realized that he couldn't go on like this. Air cutter spread out from in front of him as it carved its way through the many necks in the crowd. Ning finished the ones that weren't properly cut. Once that was done, Ning made another loud sound and waited, but no one came. Is that it for the city? He thought. Sai, how many more zombies are there to go through? He asked. What the hell? That's going to take such a long time, Ning complained. Damn it, can't they kill themselves or something? They look pretty excited about that. In the first place, how did so many people even end up becoming zombies? He asked while scratching his thigh. The moment Ning saw those words, his heart sunk for a few seconds. The system is shutting down those words almost held a bit of trauma for him. No, calm down, he told himself and started thinking of the situation more critically. I haven't done anything wrong. I only did what the system approved, so there must be something else going on, he thought. That was when he noticed the first of the notifications he had previously missed. Emergency detected? System? Ning asked as fear grew inside him again. However, this was a different fear. Fear of the unknown. System, what is happening? He asked, but he never got any answer. Instead, he got more notifications. Disabling all energy related skills, disabling all energy absorption, disabling automatic absorption system cautions host against absorbing any energy manually. Do not absorb any energy that you don't already own. Please be safe. System will now shut down indefinitely. Zero no more notification followed as Ning continued flying in the air. He was confused, really confused. Why was the system gone? From its words, this didn't sound like a punishment. Instead, it even cautioned it about something. Suddenly, Ning felt something grab onto him. Something that wasn't physical, but was at the same time. Space was wrapping around him, and in the next moment, he vanished. Do not worry. You killed everyone. A sad voice full of despair spoke to a screen in front of him. You are safe. I don't feel safe, he spoke. All future threats have been eliminated. They were my friends and families. They were strangers who had nothing to do with me, he said. Removing everyone is the best way to remove all future threats, oh god, it was me. They were all killed because of me. A man cried as hard as he could. You are now safe. You do not need me any longer, self-destructing. Even as the words from the screen in front of him came out, the man simply kept on crying, not giving any thought to what the AI in front of him was saying. Then, something caught him, and he vanished. A white circle was drawn on the ground, with many intricate details inside of it. Almost every geometrical shape could be found on top of it. A girl in a hooded figure stood next to it with a large glass vial. She opened the vial and let the blood in it pour onto the magic circle. Come forth, zero grade one, she shouted. Zero suddenly, the white circle started shining with bright colors, despite the blood on it. When the bright light disappeared, a dark figure stood on top of it. The hood the figure wore made it impossible to recognize the characteristics of the figure, but that did not stop the girl from having a crazed smile on her face. What do you wish? The figure asked with a ghastly voice. For everyone aside from me to die. The girl shouted. Are you sure? The voice asked. Absolutely, the girl said in a maniac-like voice. Granted, the figure said and disappeared. Ha 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 ha. The girl laughed in the darkroom filled with the scent of blood. And then, something caught her, and she vanished. A man floated in empty space outside an artificial satellite. This was one of the best satellites his people had, and so he had been sent here to fix it. Without it, they wouldn't be able to keep track of outer space. The man took out some pliers to work on the destroyed part in front of him when he saw something shine from the corner of his eyes. He turned his head to see what it was, and when he did, his eyes went wide. 
an asteroid the size of a large island was currently hurtling its way down to the planet at an incredible speed. Oh no. The man watched in horror as the meteor crashed onto the planet and brought such destruction that within moments the outer crust of the planet was completely blown away. He was absolutely certain that not a single person could have survived this. Tears streamed down his eyes as he looked at the planetary destruction, and in the next moment, he vanished. The demon lord brought his entire army to fight the elf kingdom. This was a surprise attack, so the elves weren't ready for it at all. The dwarves had died not long ago, and now the demons were trying to kill the elves too. The hero of the elves, the girl with green hair ran forward with her bow and. While the demons killed her kind, she sent arrow after arrow at the demons too, killing hundreds of them. However, that wasn't enough and soon her entire kind was dead. No, she shouted and turned to look at the demon lord with clear fury in her eyes. You will die for this, she said as she touched the necklace her mother had given to her. Soon, the necklace turned into an arrow, which she pointed into the air. Then, she let it loose. The arrow flew through the air until it reached the sky. Ha ha ha. That's it? You are weak, hero of elves, the demon lord said, but then he sensed something. He looked up and saw dazzling light scatter through the sky. As if targeted, they all started falling on top of every demon in the area. No, the power of moonlight, the demon lord shouted, and even as he did, he was struck dead. The hero looked at the dead demons with bated breath, and she knew that these weren't the only demons that will have died from the attack she turned around and didn't see a single soul. All she could do now was despair and weep. In the next moment, she was gone as well. Similar instances took place in hundreds of different places all over the galaxy. Every single person was teleported somewhere else, and they didn't even know it. Ning found himself staring at a white, nothingness. His eyes focused as he stood up and looked around him. Hundreds of people lay around him. Men, women, and more of every size, shape, and color were getting back up. Where am I? He thought as he looked around. The room he was in was pure white and seemed to go on for infinity. The dimensions of the room were unmeasurable for Ning. Soon sounds of cries and despair came from all around him as emotional screams filled the air. What's going on? Who did this? I didn't die. I, I, where the hell am I? People started freaking out all of a sudden as expected. The sounds finally jogged Ning's mind awake and he looked around him with more attention. There stood a girl not far away from him with a face so beautiful that she nearly looked as good as Alexis. She looked incredibly sad, but the thing that caught Ning's eyes were her long ears. Those, those look like elves from the books, he thought as he remembered back to his life on Earth. He turned around and looked at someone else. A short, but fat man with a great beard that fell down to his chest. A dwarf, he thought. Next, he saw a man in grey robes with a staff in his hand. A mage? Ning thought. Then, he saw a man with a sword strapped to his back and clear killing intent in his eyes. Aside from them, he saw a man with tails, a dark-skinned demon with goat-like eyes, a cultivator with crimson robes, and a dark-skinned man with white hair. A kid with sapphire eyes, a man in a spacesuit, a blue-skinned man confused by his surrounding, a tiger of purple color with brown wings. There were even a few goddamn robots in the area. There were truly way too many diverse people here. Just what is going on? Ning wondered. How are there so many different types of beings in a single place? They all hold different powers too from what I can see. Ning was getting more and more scared by the second. The system had simply disappeared without telling him anything and the next thing he knew he was here. Did the system teleport me and everyone else here? He wondered for a second before dispelling that thought. It was impossible since the system shut down before all of this happened. Did the system foresee this? Was it scared? Ning couldn't even teleport now to get away from here since all energy related skills were gone. You! A girl suddenly shouted, catching the attention of everyone. It was a blue haired girl with a staff that held some sort of blue gem. She had the staff pointed towards a blue skinned man as she looked at him with anger in her eyes. Who, me? The blue skinned man asked. You killed all of my kin. You will die for this, she shouted. Whoa. Whoa. Whoa, lady, I don't know who you are. I've never even seen you before. Was it you who brought me here? He asked. Your people killed mine. I thought I was done with your kind. But I see I was wrong. You will die now, she said and suddenly started speaking something. Holy ice of the frozen maiden, lend me your powers so I may defeat the foe in front of me. Eternal freezing. 
The girl shouted. Everyone around her looked at her curiously, while the girl herself looked in shock. It's, it's not working, she thought. Did you try to do something lady? The blue-skinned man's eyes went cold. You tried to kill me, didn't you? After saying that, he suddenly jumped at her. However, a barrier appeared out of nowhere, stopping him from doing so. It's good to see that you guys are starting to talk to each other already, but fighting is not allowed yet you know. A voice spoke from high in the air. Everyone looked up at once to see a figure clad in white light slowly drift downwards. He saw surrounded by so much light that grasping his features was nigh impossible. Even Ning couldn't see what he looked like despite using all of his different visions. Who are you? Someone shouted. Calm down, children. I will tell you everything you are desperate to know right now. You may call me, Genesis. As for who exactly I am, you do not need to know. The only you need to know right now is that yes, I was the one that brought you here. The male voiced Genesis spoke. Why? Someone shouted at him. Why? It's simple really, the man said, because you people have nothing to live for anymore. I chose you, and you specifically, because you were the only one that was alive on your planet. And living in such a situation is a tragedy, isn't it? So, I am here to give you all a choice, the man said. All the people looked around with a confused looks. What choice? Someone asked. I will have a little competition take place between you all. The one who wins the competition will gain the chance to reincarnate to any planet of their choice, the man said. The crowd's eyes went wild in shock, but before they could say anything, the man continued. However, that is not all. The winner will also get a chance to obtain this, the man said and brought forth his hand to show a glowing ball of iridescent colors. People looked at the glowing ball in confusion. What's that? Someone asked. The man let the silence remain in the air for a few more seconds before answering. A system. Ning felt shocked, both mentally and physically. The shock of seeing a system he had expected, but he didn't expect the physical shock. However, only later did he realize that a girl had crashed into him. Ning grabbed her and brought her to her feet and asked, Are you okay? However, even as he did, he could see the hollow eyes on her face. She was dead. Jessa was a girl born on the planet Trinium where willpower shaped how people worked. Willpower was unique energy that was named based on the mental strain it caused the person using it. It was an energy that was stored in the mind, and as such manifested its powers by giving everyone unique abilities. Some could create fire from their hands. Some could move the soil. Some could control metal. Some could transform into something else. Jessa was born with a rather high affinity with willpower, and as such, from a young age, she was sure to become one of the most successful power users in the entirety of Trinium. However, fate wasn't so kind to this girl who was meant for great things. Jealousy caused people to attack her family in order to kill her. Many other families pooled their money to hire the entire Assassin's Guild to kill her family, and more importantly kill her before she manifested her powers. That night, Jessa watched in horror as her mother and father were killed right in front of her, she was only nine at the time. When she saw the Assassins kill her family, she had only one wish, that was for the assassins in front of her to die. And as such, she manifested her power that night. The power of death. With a single thought, she was able to kill anyone. Only, she never realized that her powers weren't granted to her by willpower, but rather something she was born with thanks to someone messing with her soul in order to practice making a system. When she realized that she had this power and that it didn't even cause her mental strain like others, she started using it on everyone that she deemed was her enemy. Soon, this power twisted her into someone with a black heart and an evil mind. Not long after she had reached her twenties, the world came to know about her and followed her till the end of the world. In frustration, Jessa made one last wish that would remove all her problems, she wished for everyone in the world to die. And they did. Humans all over the planet began to die. Finally, Jessa was able to live freely, but she didn't like this life. She wanted to kill. However, now that there was no one to kill, she could just wait for herself to die. However, just as she was about to go through, she was teleported to this white room with many other humans. Her eyes went wide in glee. Finally, she would get to kill more people. She was about to do so when two people fighting caught her attention, then another white figure appeared and started telling them why he had brought them all here. A chance to redo it all over? Jessa thought in surprise. Then a smile appeared on her face. Even more people to kill. Do I have to wait or can I use my powers? She wondered and decided to test it on the man that stood in front of her. Die, 
she said in a soft voice. Jess's power of death worked in a strange way, it didn't put a strain on the user's mind, but rather on their soul. What she was able to do was use her soul as leverage to force someone else's soul to separate from their body. Without a body, a soul couldn't last in this realm and would move to the realm of souls to return to the cycle. What Jessa also didn't know was that if she ever met someone with a particularly strong soul, she would be straining her own soul way too far. When she came across someone with no soul at all, she would put all the strain in the world on her own soul. As such, when she told Ning to die, she felt her own powers snap, and on a rebound, her soul was torn to shred with no chance of reincarnation at all. She died without understanding how. Genesis looked at Jessa with confusion in his heart. He couldn't tell how she died at all. She shouldn't have access to any unique power at the moment at all. Whatever, leave her. She's dead, he said and in the next moment, her body disappeared. Ning looked in surprise when her body was gone from his hands. How did she die? He wondered. He hadn't been looking at her as his attention was on the system owner, but still, he didn't think anyone attacked her. Once she disappeared, he focused his attention back on Genesis and the iridescent ball that hung in front of him. All right, let's continue, Genesis said. I'm sure you all must be curious about the system that is in front of you all, but let's keep the information about it hidden for a little longer. For now, the task is simple. There are many monsters in the place you are going to go to. Defeat them, and you may get a crown. If you get the crown and are able to successfully defend it for 24 hours, you will advance to the next round, Genesis said. Defend it? Someone asked. Yes, Genesis said. Others can snatch it from you easily. If you cannot protect it, it will go to the other person. Then, that person will have to protect it for the next 24 hours. There are exactly 50 crowns in this competition, so please hurry towards finding one when the competition starts, okay? Genesis said. Let's begin the. Wait someone shouted genesis stopped what is it he asked what about those that can't get the crown someone asked if you can't get the crown then you lose genesis said and what happens to the losers the person asked what happens haha ha, you die of course so i suggest you find a crown soon genesis said with a laugh but no one found it funny at all if no one has any other question let us begin the competition genesis shouted suddenly white light surrounded each of the hundreds of individuals and suddenly they all vanished when the light disappeared ning found himself standing on top of a desolate land with barely any grass beneath his feet he looked around and didn't find any of the others that had been teleported along with him was everyone sent to a separate location he wondered as he looked at the surroundings to his left was a vast expanse of desert that seemed to go on for as long as his eyes could see to his right was grassland that seemed to lead towards greener areas. Having no system at the moment, Ning decided to go towards the location that was easier to hide in. So, he made his way towards the grassland, with his destination being the forests that were far away. I hope I can find those monsters that might hold the crown, Ning said to himself while his feet moved. Along the way, his focus quickly dwindled as he started thinking about what was going on. A system had appeared in front of him. Given how Genesis was acting, it was likely that he was the one that created the system. Doesn't my system hate other systems and system creators because of what they do to a normal soul? If it knew I was going to come here, why did it shut itself down? Ning wondered. Does it not want to get found out? He wondered. That seemed like a proper guess. Maybe there was a reason for the system to hide. Maybe he wouldn't have been able to get here and find such a competition taking place if Genesis had sensed his system. That's a sound guess, if any he thought to himself. Then, his thoughts moved on to the warning the system had given to him at the end. Ning looked at the bird more carefully. It was green feathered like emerald gems had been carved into every single feather of this bird. Its eyes were crimson red while the pupils were abyssal black. Its beak was the same color as its feathers, only more prismatic. The brown talons slanted towards the back as the bird flew towards Ning with another great burst of speed. Ning waited for it to do what it did previously, and just in time, the bird disappeared once more to arrive next to Ning. At the same time, Ning punched the air in front of him where the bird appeared. When his fist hit the bird's tenfold increased beak, both he and the bird were pushed backward. Despite his strong body, Ning saw the multiple bleeding points on his knuckles. Damn it, just how strong is this bird, he thought. The bird wasn't hurt at all, and it immediately returned to attack him once again. This time, it returned with its talon before itself. 
If the beak alone was that strong, Ning was sure that its talons would be even stronger. Instantly, ether filled his body as his strength skyrocketed to the point it had never before. Even as the talons flew close to him, Ning's body moved before his mind, and he instantly caught both the talons in his hands. With a bit of effort, the talons crunched like dry twigs in his hands. The bird screeched in pain and its wings suddenly turned into a large green silhouette before striking down on Ning. However, the attack was unable to phase Ning at all. In fact, all the bird managed to do was ruffle his hair a little and put some slashes on his clothes. Goddamn, is this bird's feathers really made up of gems? Ning thought. The wings definitely clinked when they flapped and glistened just like gems. Ning decided to finish the job and pulled the bird down at an incredible speed while moving his leg at the same time. The knee hit the bird right in the chest, and in the next instant, the bird's chest was caved in to the point that it could no longer live at all. To be sure, Ning tore the bird in half before letting it go. He let the ether in his body disappear quickly. Ether was a rare resource for him now that he wasn't allowed to absorb it from the atmosphere. He had a few of those giant glass spheres full of ether, but he wasn't sure how long he was going to be in this place, so he needed to be extra careful. When he heard the small sound of the bird hitting the ground, he finally looked down and slowly drifted to the ground himself. He simply had one wish right now, and that was the hope that his bird was one of the 50 different monsters that were supposed to have the crown. Ning wasn't sure if the monsters were supposed to have it physically on them, or if the crown was supposed to manifest after he killed the beast. So, he waited patiently for a few seconds and watched the corpse of the bird. Within a second, a little light flickered from deep inside the bird and Ning's hope grew. Then, the light increased more and more as something began to emerge from the bird. Yes. Ning shouted in happiness when he saw it. The crown was here. The green light exploded as more of the crown. Wait, that's not a crown, Ning thought and looked closely. That was when the giant beak of the bird emerged. Followed by its giant body, its giant wings, its giant talons, and finally, its long, feathery tails. The giant, ethereal, emerald bird emerged from the corpse of the bird. This bird was ten times as large as the dead one. What is this? Its soul? Its spirit? Ning wondered. Then, the ethereal bird turned its crimson eyes towards him. Shit! Ning said and immediately enforced his body once again before dashing forward to kill the bird before it could attack him. When his punch landed on the bird's body, he felt nothing, his fist passed through the bird, and subsequently his whole body. Ning tumbled to the ground behind the bird before coming to a stop not far away. What? He looked surprised as he stared back at the bird, he couldn't touch its ethereal body at all like he was fighting its ghost now. The bird stared at him with a hint of confusion in its eyes, it seemed to be disoriented after dying. It wasn't intelligent enough to understand what was happening but seeing its dead body, its instincts kicked in and it got ready to attack again. Ning couldn't help but frown, he couldn't physically interact with the bird, then how was he going to defeat it? Just as he thought that the bird moved its wings and started flapping as if ready to fly. However, what instead happened was a giant green tornado formed around Ning with the wind so sharp as if it had sharp, crystalline rocks flying within it. Ning pushed back the tornado using reverse gravity, and in an instant, the tornado vanished. But, along with that, the spirit of that bird had also vanished. Shit. Ning thought as he looked around, getting ready for a surprise attack. Just then, Ning felt something else wrap around him. Teleportation? He thought and used ether to disrupt space and void the teleportation powers. The bird appeared out of thin air and slashed its talons at Ning. The talons couldn't touch him, Ning was sure of that, but he still tried to move away just in case. However, as it transcended space, the talons alone appeared right in front of him and slashed all of the sharp claws at him. Ning felt the space twist around the talons as it tried to pierce into his body, and despite being an ether divinity, Ning could feel his body tearing up at parts as if it were full at the seams. God damn it! Ning frowned. This bird was more dangerous than he had imagined. The bird was a master of wind and space from what Ning could see. He wasn't sure what energy it was using to manipulate them but it was certainly stronger than the current him if he didn't use ether. Screw you. You are not the only one with spatial skills here, Ning shouted even as his body was torn apart. Ether released from his body and moved towards the bird's body, it struggled for a bit before moving inside the bird. Then, 
Ning created a point of absolute gravity which soon started devouring the bird as it stood. The bird was able to resist for a bit. If not for him being several levels higher than the bird when using ether, Ning would have likely kept on the struggle for much longer. Right now, he simply added a bit more ether and suddenly the bird crumpled in on itself as a tiny black hole grew in the space where it was. Once Ning stopped putting in energy, the black hole disappeared, and so did the bird. Ning slumped back onto the ground as he huffed a little. The wounds on his body regrew as seconds passed by and by the next minute, he was up and ready to leave. Still, he feared a little. If even such a strong bird didn't hold any crowns, what did? Just the Ning saw something flash from the corner of his eyes. He turned to look at a large pillar of light somewhere in the forest, or maybe even beyond it. What's that? He wondered. Soon, an answer came to his mind, is that the crown? His vision zoomed but he could barely see anything inside that pillar of light, it was still too far away. Let's go see what it is, Ning thought and flew towards the beam of light. He flew around for almost 10 minutes at his best speed before he reached the place, he couldn't help but be surprised at just how far the beam of light was. When he arrived, he saw the crown right in front of him, it was a golden crown with about five large spikes coming out of it, and five smaller spikes, which all ended on a small golden ball. The cylinder that made up the crown itself was about five centimeters thick and had a small round indentation all around it. Ning couldn't see all of it, but after seeing the placement of the dents on the crown, he could tell there were five of them in total. He tried to fly forward to grab the crown, but he realized that the beam of light was acting as a barrier. In the end, he was forced to stop and drop to the ground. When he did, he finally noticed the five people that seemed to have arrived at the spot already. One of them was surrounded by the beam of light and was likely the person who got the crown. He held a bloody rock in his palm as well as a dead snake beneath his leg. Seeing how the rock had killed the snake, Ning was surprised that such a beast was able to give out a crown. So it's not just a strong beast that could have had the crown huh? Ning thought. The man inside the beam of light looked like an ordinary fellow. Given how he had to use a stone, Ning was sure he came from a planet where either he didn't have any powers, or the planet itself didn't have any unique energy. Ning turned his head to look at the man that stood on the other side of the beam of light. He was a blue-haired man with a sword strapped to his waist, he was big and buff, and had wide shoulders to show that he had quite the power. Ning looked to the air on the left of him and saw a woman of red skin fly with bat-like wings behind her. She was scantily clothed, which showed her incredible figure. Other than that, she held a seductive smile as she looked at the crown slowly fall down as all of them did. Finally, Ning turned toward the most outrageous looking person here. Ning couldn't tell if this person was a man or a woman at all. After all, they were in a goddamn mecha. Ning looked at the azure colored mecha standing to his right he couldn't tell how strong this mecha was, but he hoped it didn't hold much power. After all, it was just a bunch of metals put together to look humanoid right? As he thought, the crown slowly fell to the man in the beam. The man reached out his hand to grab at the crown, but the crown phased through his hands like it were an illusion. Then, it settled onto the man's head without him doing anything. The man tried to touch his crown and finally, he could feel it. Ding! The beam of light vanished and the floor was open for everyone to fight in. The flying demoness in the sky brought out a whip of hers, which she held in her hand, ready to fight. The blue-haired man slowly brought out his sword, which too was blue as well. Ning was surprised when he saw that sword. He could see waves coming in and out from the sword's edge as water dripped from it. It was like someone crafted an ocean into a sword. The mecha to Ning's right brought out its giant gun as well and pointed it toward the man in the center. Shit. That man is in trouble, Ning thought. At the same time, a whip, a giant wave of water, and a laser blast attacked where the man stood. Before the attacks landed, however, Ning pulled the man towards him with telekinesis and opened a portal as he flew towards him. Ning grabbed the crown from his head right before the man entered the portal. Then, the crown vanished and appeared on top of Ning's head. Ning touched the crown and then looked at the group in front of him. They're not going to let me go so easily, are they? Without a moment's hesitation, Ning brought out the spear from his storage and made the ether in his body flow around himself, ready to fight. The four stood at a standstill for a second as everyone was cautious of the other person. It was hard to tell who the other person was and what they could do, however, it seemed that the blue-haired guy with the oceanic sword didn't think much of them as he slashed his sword. Like a tsunami threatening to destroy the port, 
a massive wave of water flowed toward Ning with incredible force. Ning instantly started a reverse gravity barrier around him as he flew directly out of the wave of water. Just as he was out of it, the demoness flying in the sky swung her whip at him. As it suddenly increased in length, the whip grew to surround him, however, the barrier pushed the whip and stopped it from touching him. As such, the demoness could only bring it back and flap her wings in annoyance. The man with the sword slashed once more, targeting both him and the demoness. The demoness flew away, while Ning wasn't really bothered by a bunch of water devouring him with his barrier on. Just then, he heard a small, pichu, sound from his right. The guy in the mecha had used his laser gun. Ning only saw the red blast go right past his head, missing it by a few centimeters. Shit. He cursed. The whip appeared in front of Ning again as the water died down. Ning wasn't bothered with it as much since the whip couldn't touch him. However, it surprised him when he realized that the whip had come up short. It ended just a meter in front of him, not even touching him. At the exact moment when the whip made the crackling sound, Ning felt the space twist around its tip and a shockwave of space itself went through him. Ning felt his gravity barrier refuse to work momentarily, and at that exact moment, another wave of water hit him. Ning felt himself getting pushed by the water at an incredible speed, at which point a laser blast went through where he had been standing just moments ago. Don't get in my way, a voice, altered through the machines came out of the mecha. The blue-haired swordsman gave a cold look back at him and said nothing. Damn, these people are strong, Ning thought to himself. He could very likely beat them if he fought them for an extended period of time, but he had no motivation to. They were the ones that needed to fight for the crown, not him, so, he decided to leave and go far away. As the water disappeared through the ground, Ning put out a hand next to him and started a portal to take him back to where he had come from. However, at that exact moment, he heard a crackling sound as the whip struck right next to the portal. The next second the space wavered once more and Ning watched the portal vanish. Ning felt the demoness teleport from the sky and appear right next to him and suddenly started speaking to him instead of attacking. Hey boy. Do you want this? She asked. Ning felt the allure of the woman increase by an incredible amount all of a sudden as he felt his heart more at her beauty. The smile looked ever so beautiful, and those lips, so succulent. No. Ning forced himself out of the charm and he immediately struck at her with his spear. Tisk. The demoness clicked her tongue and disappeared to appear a bit further away. I hate the men here. Everyone has such high mental strength. Shut your mouth, you succubus. After I'm done with him, I'm coming after you, the man with the ocean sword spoke. Do you think I won't kill you just because you are a little pretty? The succubus asked. Besides to know what I am, you must have had some fun nights in your world. The man's face twisted and he suddenly slashed his sword at the succubus. The succubus appeared a bit further away with a burst of roaring laughter. What, did I strike a nerve? She asked. Ning was about to leave while they bickered with each other when he saw the mecha move from the corner of his eyes. He was about to move, but the laser blast was way too fast. Before Ning knew it, his entire right arm was blown off in an instant. The two others stopped bickering. Oi, that's my target, the succubus shouted. The swordsman only glared and sent out an attack toward the mecha. Just when it was about to reach the 20 meter tall mecha, a magic circle formed in the air and defended the mecha from the tsunami. The succubus appeared behind him and struck her whip at the mecha, but once again, a magic circle appeared behind it and protected it, even from the undulations of space that followed afterward. Two panels behind the mecha moved and showed two smaller guns strapped to its back which in the next moment directly shot at the succubus. The succubus disappeared once again, arriving quite far away. You better be a man inside that machine, or I won't forgive you at all, she said as she tightened her whip, getting ready to attack. Leave the crown and go away. This is not a fight you can win at all, the blue-haired swordsman said to Ning. Ning smiled. I guess they are correct about it when they say, offense is the best defense, just taking your attacks and looking for a moment to leave won't work it seems, he said. Then, Ning's shoulder where he had been cut wriggled a little as flesh and bones started growing back on it. The other three looked in surprise and caution as his arm grew to the wrist. As Ning's fingers grew back, the spear that had flown off behind him came flying back towards him. I think it's time I protect myself better. The blue-haired swordsman was about to say something when he felt a cut on his cheeks. Blood started dripping from the cut and he immediately forged water essence into an armor around his body. 
A small magic circle appeared outside the mecca as something struck its body. Just when the person inside thought of something, another small magic circle appeared. Then another one, and another one. Soon, the mecca was entirely covered in magic circles that could only protect against the invisible attacks. If this continued, the mana stone that powered the mecca would run dry. The succubus felt something cut her skin which immediately reformed as her healing factor kicked in. However, the cut continued happening and she was forced to teleport away. Healing oneself cost a lot of magicules, and she couldn't waste it right now, however, even when she teleported to a different location, the cut still continued. She enforced her body with her magicules, but she didn't like it. What the hell is going on? She shouted. Ning held his spear in front of him as an aura radiated around him. Trees, leaves, and grasses, all started showing cuts and tears on them as barks flew off in the area. Ning frowned a little as he felt the strain on his body, but it disappeared once he used ether to enforce himself. Since there was qi in the world he was in, Ning could use his insight on spear dao to create spear qi easily. However, due to not being a cultivator, he was unable to use it to the full extent. The power of his spear qi was about 80% of what he could have actually used if he had an appropriate cultivation base. In fact, his cultivation base would have even enhanced the damage of his spear qi as well. Since he created his spear domain, the burden of the domain fell on him. Without his cultivation base, Ning was forced to handle it with his own body. Flickering white spear light flashed all around him as the domain struck everything within it. The mecha's head turned towards Ning as an altered voice sounded from it. Stop doing what you're doing. It even targeted its blaster towards Ning, ready to shoot. Ning put his hands forward and suddenly a massive gravitational force pulled the robot's arm in a different direction as the blaster shot out a red beam of a laser blast. The succubus blinked out of existence and appeared a few meters to the side as the red blast went past her. At the same time, Ning jumped towards the mecha and slammed his spear onto the mecha's body. A pink magic circle flared out to defend the mecha. But the circle struggled as spear intent flew out of Ning's spear, attacking the metal plates. The mecha creaked and cracked as the force of Ning's attack was too strong for it to handle. Go away! The person inside the mecha shouted as the blaster in its arms suddenly changed to a sword and swung towards Ning. Once again, Ning created a strong gravitational pull from the thigh of the mecha which targeted the sword. Without even watching the mecha attack its own leg, Ning pulled his spear back and set out another massive slam with his spear. Authorization 229B4. Remove all other defenses and focus only where the spear is falling. Authorization accepted. Removing all defenses. Defense is now focused on left chest plate. Focus the defense on wherever he attacks, the person inside the mecha shouted. The flickering pink magic circle brightened all of a sudden as multiple of the same circles stacked on top of each other creating a barrier that Ning couldn't break through at all. In the next moment, Ning suddenly turned and struck the whip just as it landed next to him. Space undulated once more as Ning was pushed back, but that was the extent of it. He watched the succubus fly far away as small cuts threatened to appear on her body. At the same time, a massive ocean wave arrived next to Ning. Ning directly flew up out of the way but the mecha took the direct hit. Outer shell integrity is decreasing. Need authorization to put relocate defensive circles. Authorized, the person inside the mecha shouted. Finally, the defense was put back in place and the mecha was saved. Ning flew directly towards the succubus in the air, ignoring the swordsman below that was surrounded by crushed water. He couldn't attack her from far away as he didn't have any ranged attacks with his spear intent at the moment. When he got close, the succubus moved her whip to attack him. Ning suddenly enforced his spear and slashed at the incoming whip. When the spear and the whip struck each other, the whip was easily beaten with Ning's enforced spear. Not only was the spear itself made up of strong material, but it was also enforced using the ether from an ether divinity. There was no way he was losing to such a weapon at all. The whip's attack never landed, so no space twisted around the whip either. Ning's momentum continued as he arrived next to the succubus. The succubus feared him and tried to teleport away, but Ning had been ready for this. A massive gravitational pull appeared from his spear tip as it distorted space around him. Even as the succubus teleported, when he reappeared, she was still next to the spear, getting pulled ever so closer to his spear. No, she screeched suddenly, but Ning already had his reverse gravity barrier put up around him. Since sound couldn't travel through a vacuum, 
the screech which affected the two other people down below did nothing whatsoever to him. After a second or two, the succubus teleported away, but she still couldn't get far away. Ning then clutched the spear as well as he could and thrust it straight into the succubus. The demoness screamed as the spear dug through her chest, then, her body crumpled under the strong gravity of the spear. Only then did Ning finally stop the gravity around his spear and turned around towards the two remaining individuals. The swordsman and the person in the mecha frowned as they saw the succubus die. The swordsman slashed his sword again, sending out another massive wave of water towards Ning, but Ning simply pushed it back with his barrier. Next, the mecha's arm, which had a gun in it now was, was moved until it pointed towards the swordsman. The person inside the mecha didn't shoot, but he couldn't bring his arm back either. Ning immediately dashed towards the man in the water armor. The swordsman dashed forward too and soon the sword and the spear clashed. Ning thought that he was superior in strength, so he expected to easily knock away the sword. However, when his spear went through the sword like he had hit a pillar of water, Ning was surprised. A massive water wave pushed Ning far away, he barely managed to get out of it by flying upwards and looked at the sword in shock. He had thought that the sword was something that had water properties to create gushes of water. However, now he found out that the sword was actually made up of water entirely. That's a fascinating sword. I wonder how it was made, Ning thought. Suddenly, he saw the hulking mecha jump into the air, with its gun already transformed into a sword and slammed down of Ning. Ning strengthened his body as much as he could and hit the incoming sword with his spear like a bat hitting a ball. A magic circle appeared in front of the sword, which survived a split second before Ning's spear pierced through and cut halfway into the sword. Damn it! It's too large to cut it in one go, Ning thought and jumped back to attack the mecha again. Repair the sword, the person inside the mecha shouted as he controlled the handles to guide the machine. They saw a visual of the humanoid mecha on the screen as all power went towards the sword. Just as the sword was repaired to a certain extent, the person slammed his fight on a button, and suddenly the sword changed back into a blaster as he pointed it toward Ning. Bang! Boom! A massive explosion rung throughout the machine as the person inside was tossed around a bit. What happened? The person shouted, you took a direct hit from behind. The person quickly looked towards the screen that showed the back of the mecha and saw a portal quickly disappearing. Damn it! I got hit by my own shot. The person shouted, then, he heard another boom. In his lack of focus, Ning pushed through his defenses and thrust his spear into the blaster. Ning didn't know where the blaster's power source was, but he was certain that he could easily get it to not work if he cut at random parts in the blaster. After all, this was a complicated machine that needed a lot of complicated inner workings to do its task. Destroying a single one would destroy it all. So, Ning stabbed the blaster at different places one after another. A few of those times, he felt a light electric shock, but it wasn't able to hurt or stop him at all. After a while, he saw lights flicker inside the gun and he immediately took off. The gun exploded in the mecha's hands, but not with the same ferocity as Ning would have expected. At the same time, the swordsman looked at Ning and gritted his teeth. The crown on top of Ning's head was very alluring, and he definitely wanted it, but the fight was hard. Ning wasn't as easy of a fighter as he had thought at the beginning. The swordsman pointed his sword toward Ning as he prepared to remove the seals from his sword, however, he stopped. If Ning simply teleported away, he wouldn't be able to do anything in the end. There was no winning this in his eyes. Screw this, the swordsman shouted and turned around, before running back into the forest. Ning watched the swordsman disappear into the woods and wondered for a second if he should stop him at all, however, he didn't feel that was right. There was nothing for him to gain from following the man since he seemed to have given up on the crown already. So, Ning turned towards the mecha and pounced on it. The robot tried to punch him, grab him, and push him away, however, no matter what it did, Ning kept on coming back to the robot to strike it. The protective circle soon failed as it was either cut off from the power source, or the power source itself had run out. Then, Ning went searching for the pilot of this mecha. He first carved the head open, but the pilot wasn't there at all. He then moved to the chest and also carved it open, turning the entire mecha into scrap metal. However, he couldn't find the pilot there either. Finally, he carved open the stomach area of the machine and reached a small circular metal box that was made up of extra durable material. Ning carved into it as well and used his both hands to rip it open and show what was inside. 
When light shined through that hole and the person inside was visible, Ning's eyes couldn't help but widen. Inside was a small person about the size of an eight year old child. He had almost no hair, wrinkled skin, a pointy nose, and extra pointy ears. The most curious part of the person was the color of his skin. It was entirely green. Are you, a goblin? Ning asked. So what? Kill me. Give me a warrior's death, a high pitched voice screeched from the goblin's mouth. Ning felt a bit of hesitation when he saw that, he didn't feel right when he was about to kill someone that was only a small child from his perspective, no matter how old the goblin was. Ning sighed and left the goblin, do whatever you want. With that, a portal opened next to him, and Ning vanished. Ning stood on a tree, watching in every direction for signs of movement. As the night had fallen, he had realized a problem that he hadn't seen happen during the day. His crown grew way too bright, it seemed, he noticed, that the further away he was from one of the participant, the more his crown would shine. Right now, it felt like there was a high wattage bulb hung right on top of his head. So, he had to watch out for anyone that would come and try to steal his crown. Time slowly passed by as he waited, but fortunately, no one seemed to come by. Still, Ning didn't let down his guards. He slurped on his ether fluid he had as he slowly absorbed that and that only, making sure to not touch anything that was outside of his body. While he waited, Ning noticed something in the distance slowly walking in his general direction. He got ready for battle, but when he saw the person, he stopped and showed a confused face. The person that walked through the thicket of trees was a girl in her late twenties. She had silver white hair flowing down on fair face. She wasn't tall or short, and wore a flowing dress of pink and green. Her face showed signs of fear and anxiety as she never dared to look at him at all, keeping her eyes towards the ground. That only gave Ning a very clear view of the crown on her head. That was what confused Ning so much. Why did someone with a crown come to me? He thought in a confused expression. He hello, the girl said through a voice crack. She was really nervous from what Ning could see. Hi, what are you doing here? Ning asked suspiciously. The girl slowly lifted her head up and looked at Ning before looking back down. I was hoping to get you help, she said. What is it? Ning asked. Can can I work along with you? We both have crowns, so I was hoping you could help me protect mine, the girl said. Can't you protect it yourself? Ning asked. The girl quickly shook her head. I, I can, but I don't want to hurt others, she said. Ning's eyes narrowed in suspicion. How did you get the crown? Ning asked. Through luck, or bad luck, I guess, the girl said in a low voice. Ning looked at her for a second and said, Very well, you can stay around. But if too many people come, I won't help you, okay? Yes, yes. Please, I just don't want people to come. That's it, she said. Okay, Ning said and continued absorbing his ether as he kept an eye on the girl below. He wanted to use Omni analysis on her to see what she was like, but that hurt him way too much mentally. Without the system being active, he didn't know what would happen if he accidentally looked at someone with a very high power level even when compared to him. The system usually put him in coma when the mental stress got too high, however, what about when it wasn't there? No, no I can't do that, he thought. He would be able to analyze people that used ether, chi, or were body cultivators so that was something. Well, I can just ask her, can't I? Ning thought. Miss, can you tell me your name? Ning asked from above. Sorry, the girl jolted out of some thought as she looked at Ning with fear and confusion. Your name, Ning said. I'm just trying to make idle talk to pass some time. Oh, it's Nova Fable, the girl said. I see. Nice to meet you, Miss Nova. I am Ning Ruigong, Ning said. If it isn't too much to ask, may I know what power Miss Nova uses? The girl got suspicious and nervous, as one would if they were suddenly asked to reveal something that gave them an advantage. Are you going to hurt me? She asked with narrow eyes. What? Ning asked. No, I have no such plans. I merely wanted to know what power system you had. What is the source of your powers? S. Souls. We get powers from our soul, the girl said. You get power from your soul? Ning asked curiously. He had never expected soul itself to be a source of power. May I ask how you cultivate this soul power? Do you sit around absorbing soul energy, or is there some other method? Ning asked. I'm not comfortable talking about that, the girl said. Ning wanted to push more to learn about this curious soul powers, but in the end, he decided to drop it. Then which planet do you come from, Miss Nova? 
Ning asked. P Planet Brifford, the girl said. You were alone in this planet before you came here then. How long were you alone? What happened to the others? Ning asked. Others? She asked as her mind moved and she saw it once again. Bodies flopping into the ground all around her. Voices being silenced one by one. Everyone died while she survived. Even though she didn't want to. No, 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 no. The girl clutched her head in between her palms and started rocking back and forth as she wished away the thoughts in her mind. She didn't want to see the visions at all. However, the more she wished she didn't see it, the clearer her visions became. Very clearly, she could see the dead bodies of her friends and families. Her mother's loose arms fell from her shoulders mid-hug. Her father held her too, but his arms were starting to loosen as well. Her sister lied dead not far from her, and so did her friends. Outside her house, she could see a street full of dead bodies, and she knew that was not the end of it. She knew that all the people in the entire world had died that day. And it had all been her fault. Nova kept on shaking, and Ning who was looking at her couldn't help but feel bad about it. Was it because of what I asked? Ning asked as he dropped from the branch next to the girl. The girl nearly jumped in fear when she saw him land. Wait, you don't have to be scared, Ning said. Please go away and leave me alone, the girl said with a solemn tone to her voice. I don't think you should be alone right now, Ning said. Don't you need a friend? I, I, the girl stammered for a moment before finally saying in a very low voice, I don't deserve a friend. Her guilt had been eating her up more than this entire competition ever could. I don't want to hurt anyone, I don't want to hurt anyone, she shouted in her own mind. Ning saw the troubled look on her face and patted her head. Don't worry, it will all be fine, he said. The crown did nothing to obstruct his hand. The girl flinched, but let it happen. It had been a while since she had felt a human connection and she let it happen. Only, she feared that this wasn't something she deserved. She waited in agony for Ning to just die right now too, however when the pat continued, she froze. What? She turned around to look at him with a shocked face. What? Ning stopped patting and looked awkwardly. Had he gone too far with patting her head, did she worry I would steal her crown? You, you didn't die, she said. What? Ning brought back his hand and looked at it for signs of poison. Was I supposed to die? The girl quickly shook her shocked head. No, but people usually do when they're around me, she said. Oh, don't worry. I won't die, Ning said with absolute confidence. If there was anything he knew, it was exactly this fact. Nova looked a little confused now as to why he wasn't dead. Maybe his show of honesty is fake. He just doesn't care about me, she thought. She wanted everyone to be exactly like that. Only then would she not kill them all. After coming to this new world, with hundreds of other people, this was one thing she did not want. She did not want to feel guilty over the death of the last remaining members of nearly 500 planets. Ning on the other hand was more focused on their survival. So, even as he kept her company, his eyes were looking in every direction, searching for signs of people coming closer. Over the course of the night, he did notice two or three people coming closer. However, when they could see the two of them more clearly, they usually turned around and left. Wow, her idea is working perfectly, Ning thought. With not a single person attacking them, the night went by quietly with no more attacks. As dawn broke, they still weren't attacked. Ning and Nova were in the thicket of the forest and they couldn't see any pillars of light around them, so they weren't able to tell if more crowns had appeared close to them. Thus they had to guess that this world was very big, and they just happened to be around the same place. After waiting for half a day more, it got close to the time when Ning had taken the crown. Hum, my 24 hours will be up very soon, Ning said. Oh, I will have to wait for a little after nightfall, Nova said. The shine from their crown wasn't possible to see in the bright daylight. They could only tell it existed based on the lack of shadows around them. Just as his time was growing closer, Ning sensed movements from in front of him. Nova got up as well as walked a little back to hide behind Ning. I, I don't want to fight. Please return, she shouted from behind Ning. As she did, a sword grew out of nothing in her hand. Ning watched in shock. He didn't notice any storage system on her body. Where did the sword come from? No, go away, go away, she shouted, but the people kept coming closer. Soon, Ning could see five new faces, two men, two women, and one bird. 
593 Ning recognized one of the girl's clothes and immediately understood her to be a cultivator. He needed to be careful of her arrows. The other girl wore full body metal armor like a medieval knight and even her face was hidden. If not for her breastplate, Ning wouldn't even have recognized her gender. One of the men wore a light green sweater and some cotton pants. He held a smile that wanted everything. There were daggers on both of his hands, and it looked like he was quite confident with them. The other man wore a dark suit and pants. Ning saw something gathering around the man's palm as he got ready to fight. Ning wondered what that power was. Finally, his eyes fell on the final beast of the group, which also seemed like the strongest of the people here in here. The bird was a mixture of red and yellow, and even a little orange and black. Flame grew all around his body as if the entire bird was made up of fire. Ning's eyes got cold when he saw that. He had heard about this beast but had never seen them back in Kumia, only their descendants who held some of their bloodlines. Are you kidding me? Ning thought to himself. We're supposed to fight a goddamn phoenix? Please please help me, the girl said from behind Ning. I don't know how much I can help you, Ning said. There is someone here that can keep me occupied all by themselves. Ning saw fear creep into the girl's eyes. Sigh, don't worry. I will do what I see eh? Just as Ning was about to say something, bright silvery light gathered around him, and he vanished. Ning's 24 hours with the crown was up, and he had passed. When Ning disappeared and reappeared, he found himself inside the white room. He looked around and noticed a single other person standing far away from him. A man in a demon mask. Ning ignored the person and focused on his own troubles. He had told Nova that he would help her, and yet he came here. It hadn't been out of his own volition, but he still felt a little guilty about it. With the five others attacking her, Ning could only hope that her soul was strong enough to protect her. She had after all won the crown for herself beforehand somehow, he hoped she was powerful enough to do so again. As he waited, more and more people started appearing. Within the next three hours, there were ten people in the white room. As three more hours passed, there were now twenty-five. After more hours passed, another light flashed, and Ning saw Nova appear from the light. He looked at her in shock as not a single strand of her hair was missing and not a speck of dirt landed on her. Did she not fight? Ning wondered as he walked toward her. Nova? He called. Are you alright? Nova jerked a little when she heard her name being called out. However, when she saw it was Ning, she felt a little relieved. I'm sorry. I didn't know my time would have been up so quick. Are you alright? Ning asked. I, I'm fine, the girl said in a somber voice. Is she? Ning thought. What happened to the other five, especially the bird? Ning asked. Nova's eyes moved around as her mind moved to remind her of the scene she had witnessed eight hours ago. No, I don't want to see it, she told herself, but her mind refused. She saw the vision of the girl with the bow and arrow shooting herself through her face. The man in the suit pierced his own heart with the power he had been gathering in his hands. The man with the dagger slit his own throat, while the girl in the shining armor hit herself with the sword so many times that her armor cracked through and the sword carved her body in half. Then, the phoenix who witnessed this all feared for its life and simply died. It couldn't even come back from its death as all other phoenixes did. Nova had already crouched on the ground in the white room as she mumbled, No, 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 softy beneath her voice. Ning watched with a stunned face and didn't know what to say or do. Come on, you need to get a hold of yourself, he said. He grabbed her by the shoulders and hoisted her up before taking her outside the group of people that were starting to gather. Nova was still a mess as she shivered from what she had done. Ning thought he understood, to a certain extent. This was probably the feeling he had felt after the system punished him for killing the innocent the first time. All the fear and pain had been especially terrifying. If the girl was feeling anything like he did afterward, she needed some help. It's okay. You didn't kill because you wanted. You did because you had to, Ning said. It was the better alternative than they killing you, right? It's not like you want to die. No, I want to die, Nova said. I want to die, but, but. She broke down into tears, leaving a stunned Ning to become speechless. What do you say to someone who had seen so much death, caused so much death, and then wanted themselves to die? Do you say that those deaths weren't their fault? No, it obviously was. Do you say that those deaths didn't matter? That was even worse? There wasn't much Ning could think of to say. Was there even an answer to this problem? As he thought that, more and more light flashed around him. Soon, 
the entire area was filled with 50 people. At that exact moment, a bright white light appeared high in the white nothingness as Genesis returned back to the room. He looked down below him and made a surprised gasp as he said, Wow, you are all here. And I can't believe you guys didn't even need my help. Honestly, I expected the fights to go on for another day or two. I wonder if a certain someone decided to randomly drop some crowns for some of you, Genesis said with a hidden glee in his voice. Everyone down below could tell that he was implying that he had helped them a little. A few of them glared up in the air as they remembered the coincidence with how they found their crowns. Okay, okay, I won't joke any longer, Genesis said. For now, congratulations, you have passed the first test. Look at you all, that crown looks so good on you. Ning looked around at the 50 different people. He noticed the man with the water sword not far away from him, but he didn't notice the goblin or the man that had actually earned the crown he had taken. Ning knew what had likely happened to them, but he didn't want to believe it. Sir, what happened to the ones that didn't make it? One of the girls asked. Huh? Did I not tell you all already? Those that don't make it to the second round all die, Genesis said. Sounds of shock and fear went through the crowd. Some remembered the friends they had made. Others remembered the people they had let live. Some remembered the people that had forced the crown on them. If they weren't here, then they all had to have died already, and that didn't feel right to them. Playing around with lives. I wouldn't expect anything less from a being that creates systems, Ning thought. Before the next competition, you all get a week-long break, Genesis said. Go heal, train, and have fun. With that, everyone in the white room once again vanished. When Ning reappeared, he found himself in an unfamiliar tavern of the sort with a few people inside, eating and drinking. The tavern owner cleaned the countertop with a wet towel, giving no attention to anyone. Where am I? Ning thought to himself, understandably confused. Then, he noticed something he hadn't noticed beforehand. Something flickered on top of the tavern owner's head. When he looked closely at it, it looked like a bunch of question marks that were permanently hovering on top of his head. As Ning stared at him, the owner saw him as well. Weary traveler, how may I help you? he asked. Ning was surprised that the owner noticed him. Am I not in that game anymore? None of these people seem like they're from the 50 winners, he thought as he looked around. Then, he noticed more and more of the same question marks appear on top of everyone's heads. The hell? he thought. Then, he looked back towards the owner, who gave him a surprised look and said, Weary traveler, how may I help you? Ning paused. Didn't he say the same thing last time too? He thought. Then, he thought for a second and answered the man. May I know what place I'm at? He asked. Absolutely, the tavern owner said. You're in the handmade tavern of the Ocean Heart City. Where the hell is that? Ning wondered. What country is this? He asked. The tavern owner gave a confused look for a second before giving a surprised look as he said, Weary traveler, how may I help you? Ning didn't like this. He didn't like this at all. Sprinting, he walked out of the tavern and into the bright sunlight. When the bright light mellowed, he saw houses, made of wood and stones. Each of those houses reminded him of medieval times back on earth, not unlike what Vilmore looked like during his first visit. Just as he thought that someone brushed past him, Ning turned to the side to see a young boy running along the road with his friends, giggling as he did so. Johnny, your mother will beat you if you don't return, one of the boys said. I'll return soon enough. Stop being a scaredy cat Hank, the other boy replied. As Ning watched them, the question marks on two of the boys' heads suddenly blurred and changed to Johnny and Hank. The question marks were people's names, and unless he knew their names, it wouldn't show them at all. As he thought that, a bright white light shined from high in the sky and Genesis walked through. His features were still invisible due to the bright light, but Ning thought he could see a face underneath all that light. I would like to formally welcome you all to this humble little planet that I created myself a name after myself, Planet Genesis, the big blob of light proclaimed. He created a planet. Ning thought in shock as he looked around him. How much energy would someone need to do that? How does he have that much energy? Ning looked around dumbfounded and that was when he noticed the regular folks going about their work like there wasn't a man clad in light shouting words that reached the entire planet. Ning looked at them closely, and soon, Suspicion grew in his heart that feared him more than it should have. You are all currently in one of the cities I created for this planet, meant as a safe haven from all that remains outside. No man, no beast, no entity, no power will ever enter these walls. 
it's a safe haven because violence is forbidden here, Genesis said. You may rest, eat, drink, dance, do anything as your heart desires. The people in front of you will not stop you, for they can't stop you. What you are seeing are humans I created myself, and they do as I will. For now, I will them to treat you like an emperor. I hope you have a pleasant week, for I fear the next one won't be so pleasant. Lastly, there is this thing I'm trying out to get you accustomed to using the system before you get it. I think I should explain, nah, I'm sure you'll figure it out yourself. Goodbye, Genesis said and disappeared. Ning looked around as he realized his fear had come true. These humans, he really created them, he understood. Calling them humans felt wrong. They may have had muscles, bones, hearts, and minds, but they didn't have the most important thing that made a man a man. They didn't have a soul. Without a soul, these humans that walked all around him were no better than if they were robots. They had no will of their own, so Ning didn't like looking at these mere human husks. Eat with them? Drink with them? Have fun with them? Ning didn't think he could? He couldn't explain it clearly, but he felt the aversion stemmed from his understanding of the human body from the system. A body without a soul was nothing but a corpse. To him, these current men, women, and children looked no better than the zombies he obliterated on the other planet. Perhaps worse. At least the zombies had souls. As he looked towards those men and women, he noticed the question marks on their heads again. He said this was to teach people about the system, right? Ning thought. Then, does it work as a system? Ning didn't know, but he had to try. He took a deep breath and said a single word. Status. Suddenly, a blue light flashed in front of him as a transparent panel hovered in front of him. I knew it, he thought as he checked the info on the panel. Name. Ning Ruigong Age. Unknown planet of origin. Hoflar power in usage. She. Ether. Unknown skills. Ning looked at the thing with puzzled eyes. Power in use is Chi and Ether, but what is the unknown? Is that me using powers that were born not out of unique energies, but rather the system?